<laughs> How'd you play out there, guys? Uh, well, I found a consistent challenge most of the year. This is the grass on the golf What is happening, everyone? Welcome back. First podcast of the new year, Beltway Golfer, Alex Dixon here. Um, technically episode 24 overall, um, but excited to kick off 2021. Uh, may have noticed took the winter off. Um, main reason is you like to do these interviews and podcasts in person at golf courses, and it was cold winter. It's cold outside. And, and in addition, with all the social distancing protocols, you know, doing them inside is a little tricky. So took a few months off to regroup and we're excited to get going with a new lineup of podcasts and guests for the new year. Um, to kick us off, if you've played golf um, at all in the DC area, you have played a course that was either touched, designed, renovated, um, likely by one of the folks uh, within the Alt Clark and Associates design firm. Um, started by uh, Ed Alt <clears throat> with, a, with a, a, his own company, which Tom will get into in our interview. But Ed Alt, his son Brian Alt, and Tom Clark made up the, the three partners of the firm. Um, we met up with Tom Clark at his latest project, Cut Along at Lake Anna, which is open for play, uh, but is having its grand opening later this summer in 2021. Um, and we sat down with them for almost two hours. We're going to break this one up into two parts to kick off the 21 season, 2021 season, excuse me. Um, and the reason being, Tom Clark has been a golf course architect for 50 years, for half a century. It's the only job he's really ever had. He started working with Ed Alt right out of college, as he talks about in our interview. So, you know, when you've been designing golf courses for half a century, you know what, you deserve a two-parter. Uh, Tom was a pleasure to speak with. Um, he goes into great detail about working for, for Ed Alt and then um, you know, his career as a designer. Um, in part one, we're gonna talk about his, his history and his career, and then part two, we'll talk more specifically about his project, uh, Cut Along at Lake Anna, uh, which is a really exciting one. Um, but, but Ed Alt, Tom Clark, Brian Alt, you know, their, their name is on a lot of golf courses around here. Um, but I assure you, they've done even more work than you realize, especially in the Mid-Atlantic region, since they were based here for, for decades, aside from designing new courses, both w for local municipalities, um, you know, daily fee courses, but also private courses. They, they renovated quite a bunch, quite a, quite a few. You know, uh, Burning Tree he talks about, Congressional, Chevy Chase, Columbia, you name it. They, they've touched just about every course around here, not to mention uh, designing um, Avenel from scratch. So um, you, you can't really do a show about golf in the DC area without talking to um, Tom Clark uh, or Brian Alt. And, and Brian, we're actually gonna have, um, do a podcast with later in the spring. Um, so we were excited to do so, learn more about their firm, learn more, learn more about their careers. Um, and had just had a great conversation with Tom. So let's get to it. I hope you enjoy it. Here it is, Tom Clark. All right, we are out here at uh, Cut Along at Lake Anna with uh, a prolific golf course designer, golf course architect, Tom Clark. How are you? Very good. Thanks. Nice uh, to have you here. I'm glad to be here. So we, uh, we just got done touring the course, playing, playing a much of the course. Um, it's just... Just getting open, just open for play late 2020? Late December, actually. Uh, actually, uh, beginning of December, all 18 holes were completed. So they played all through the winter. And uh, as I said, we had 11 holes open all last summer. Um, and we basically had a nine hole loop and you could play two extra holes. So then we kept adding holes as we continued to progress and open and then we finally got all 18 open I think December 5th. Well it was uh, tremendous to get eyes on it and to come down here and check it out for the first time play it. We're, we're going to talk a bunch about 
cut along in this course and this exciting project in the opening. Um, but but first, I think we're going to talk a lot about your history, your 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 long career as a golf course mm -hmm. architect, particularly um, around the Beltway, which is the, which is what this podcast is all about. So we'll, we'll kind of get get into it there. So um, you worked with and for and were, were a lead designer for many, many years for Alt, Alt Clark and Associates. Well, it actually, the firm I originally went to work for in 1971 was Edmund B. Alt Limited. Uh, I was hired directly out of college. Matter of fact, the day after I graduated, uh, Mr. Alt wanted me to come to work. Went to college where? Penn State Penn University. State, okay. And I had come down for an interview because I had a professor, uh, Lynn Miller, and he and Ed worked together on a course up near State College called Talk Trees. It was a new home site development and basically a, a little destination resort, uh, high end. And they had become pretty good friends. And uh, Ed had lost his only employee. Um, about a month before he made the inquiry, but he contacted Lynn and see if he had a bright young student <laughs> that may be interested in golf course design. And well, this is what, what year you graduated Penn State? This was 1971. Okay. And right before graduation, uh, we had two, you talk about prolific designers. It was Cornish and Robinson, but Jeff Cornish, who lived to be 100, uh, basically was in the same caliber that Robert Trent Jones and actually Ed Alt as far as the number of courses he was involved in. Well, Bill Robinson happened to graduate out of Penn State also and literally went to work for Jeff and within, I think, a year became a partner. It okay. was Cornish and Robinson. The reason so, they were brought down is our landscape architecture professor wanted to teach us how to integrate home sites with a golf course. So first, you know, he brought them down to teach us how to design a golf course. Well, that's no easy task in a couple days. And consequently, uh, Jeff Cornish was there for, I think, two days, and then Bill Robinson stayed. But Bill would work in our design studio, and I would be up there at night, you know, looking over his shoulder and seeing what he was producing. and. Bill was a tremendous artist, and he was doing a lot of green drawings with um, spot elevations and mounding, but he would also do a sketch of each one. And I just said that, that this really looks intriguing and interesting. I said, how do you get into this profession? And he said, well, Tom, you're either born into it or you're luck into it, like I did. And uh, what he means by born into it, like Reese and Bobby Jones with Robert Trent Jones. Um, even our own Eric Alt, you know, mm -hmm. was with us for a while, Brian's son. So he locked into it. As I said, he was hired right out of college also and, you know, became a partner that quickly because both, you know, myself and Bill, you know, went to work for individuals with extraordinarily busy. Mm -hmm. And um, I can tell you for a fact, the very first day I went to work for Ed Alt, he took me down to um, Richmond, Virginia. It was a 27-hole complex that mm -hmm. he was working on. And we walked around uh, that golf course, and I said, this is terrific, the construction, the, you know, just being outside. And I'll never forget that, you know, he drove down. He wanted me to meet him at his house at some ungodly hour, like 4.30 or whatever, so we get a full day in. So uh, we drove down in the dark and we were there at the crack of dawn. <laughs> and on the way back, he said, uh, Tom, you know how to drive. I said, well, that's how I got down to, you know, Maryland from Pennsylvania. And consequently, he uh, basically threw me the keys and said, pull over there and get me a six pack of beer. <laughs> and said, you can, You're have, driving. You can have one. And I'm <laughs> like, all right, thank you. So he never drove again. That was, that was his chauffeur for the rest of my career. Uh, but so, I never got out of the office again for another six months. Yeah. He, he was so backlogged with work, you know, he would just say, okay, I need this, this, and this. 
Now, granted, I had one day experience out in the field, mm -hmm. so it's kind of hard to emulate greens or, you know, design things. And they said, well, there's a whole bunch of files in there, just pull them out. Okay. Well, I'm not going to just copy something and, you know, I'm basically trying to make a mark here. So, and I could not just do this with spot elevations. I had to do it with contours because that's what I was used to. So I started redrawing all his green plans. Uh, and, you know, I just didn't want a drawer full. I, you know, the objective is each individual site has its own manifestation, as you saw today when we talked about, okay, why is the BRX on an angle like this? Well, there was a natural tr feature here, and mm -hmm. we just angled it according to the form follows function. It's, you know, a sure. landscape architecture principle. And consequently, um, I started knocking things out right and left for him with not a whole lot of knowledge of what I was doing. And I will never forget, several years later, I became a member of the American Society of Golf Architects. And one of the, uh, I guess my, uh, much older than I was, Bob Cup, who used to work for Jack Nicholas, but he was now out on his own, mm -hmm. and a prolific designer in his own right, came up to me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, Tom, I understand that you worked on Lewistown Country Club. He said, that's where I grew up. I said, I really, I had no idea. Well, I'll never forget, Mr. All came in and said, I need nine greens, so I need them tomorrow. So here I am knocking out greens with no idea what I'm doing. And I had drainage going off the back of these greens and you know, they were crazy. And uh, I'm figuring Bob's gonna say, oh my God, they're the worst greens because this is his home course where he grew up on. He'd never seen the new nine holes, but he was just saying, wow, this is terrific. He's like, those greens are great. And I'm like, you know, Bob, I didn't know what I was doing back then. He said, well, then keep doing it. <laughs> so uh, it's amazing. And golf architecture, I knew, was then arbitrary. I mean, what some people like and enjoy, other people do not. Sure. And as I said, the objective of my career has been uh, to please the masses, but to really please the people that support the golf course. In other words, I do not give a lot of thought for that back tee because you know you get 0.2% of the people play back there at right. 7,400 yards. But those forward four tees or whatever, that's the bulkier play. And that's why they're larger in size and uh, you know it's such big tees and diversity. And that's the people that support it is, you know, the, the white player, sure. meaning the white tee player, sure. the gold tee player, yep. the ladies. And even, you know, we have a, out here at Cutalong, for instance, we have a, a family tee. Yep. When you can bring people out here. Um, that was a long answer for a short question. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Uh, well, backing up one minute. So, so it, when you joined uh, Ed Alt's firm, in 1971, he had he had been going for some time, but he had been going for, for well over a decade. Had had, had designed a mm. number of courses, certainly in the Washington D.C. area. I'm curious, and, and you say he was he had he was already so backlogged with work. Like wh why? What was what was it about him, his firm, that he was able to get so much work? Well, as I said, I think the fact is he started back in the 50s. And in the 60s, before I got there, he had done probably with his partner at the time, which was Al Jamison, who was a golf professional. They were pressing 100 courses. And, um, you know, when we talked about the idea of Beltway Golfer, I suggested that, you know, you hear a little bit about, you know, our firm and especially uh, Ed Alt and the fact that you know, not only was Ed a terrific amateur golfer, but, you know, and winning a lot of tournaments in the Washington metropolitan area, which gave him the inroads into a lot of mm -hmm. uh, jobs. And there were a lot of courses, obviously, that were existing. There was a lot of courses that, you know, could be built, uh, meaning there was room. And literally, as I said, you know, when Brian and I came along, we had to go further out. But, you know, just a list, you know, of some of the courses that, you know, your listeners or whatever may not have realized that Ed all did. Um, Eisenhower, Montgomery Village, Northwest Park, Henson Creek, 
Reston, South, Hidden Creek, uh, South Wales, West Park out near Leesburg, Chenvalee, Nine New Holes, Allview up towards Baltimore, Paint Branch, Poolsville, Sligo Creek, River Bend, uh, Baltimore Country Club, I believe it was their, their second course. Mm -hmm. Brenton Woods, which was the International Monetary's and these, these, these are all new designs. These are all new courses. Yep. Um, Chartwell, Hawthorne, Hunt Valley, Lakewood, Suburban, Chantilly. <laughs> the list just goes on and on. Algonquian, Andrews Air Force Base, Springfield Country Club, Bowling Green, uh, Turf Valley, Heritage Harbor, Hobbit's Glen, uh, and then remodels. Um, the, 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 list, the, list, the list is immense. It is. <laughs> um, I mean, it's just like when the bell and everything, rings. And all the ones you just named there don't have necessarily Tom Clark's name on them or Brian Alt. Those were, those were Ed Alt. These were all Ed's original designs, and as I said, with his partner, Al Jameson. Mm -hmm. And we subsequently then actually Brian and I went back and reworked a lot of these courses, did redesigns on them. And even Ed was called in, you know, he was still alive at the time and some of the courses, you know, and said, well, we need to do this and that. So we went back and revisited a lot of the courses. And also, as I said, there was a period when the Walter, Washington Beltway was built and it affected a lot of courses in the area Bethesda Country Club, he did a lot of rerouting. Burning Tree, he did. Mm -hmm. um, Indian Springs were the original one. Um, you know. What do you do at Burning Tree, for instance, do you know? Uh, well, if you look at the holes right near the Beltway, that's the holes that were affected. You can actually okay. see them now during the winter. And um, it's just, you know, he got the call because he was the only architect around. Yeah. I mean, there was no other real architects practicing. I mean, Reese Jones was up in New Jersey or mm -hmm. Trent Jones. And, um, you know, it, was that a part of it that back, I mean, we're talking about the, the majority of the 60s. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the 60s, it, was it was it cost prohibitive to for uh, whoever is commissioning the project or doing a renovation to look out? It, it was just it was. Was it just the fact that 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 Ed was was local, and 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 the fact that he was local, he could be on site, and maybe the the cost of bringing somebody from the opposite side of the country, or was it was it more than that? That's probably ninety percent of it, and the fact that um, <clears throat> today, you know, with international travel, anything, I mean, we're getting golf architects from England over here, meaning to sure. compete with. Yeah. Uh, people think nothing of calling somebody on the West Coast to work on a course on the East Coast. And in the 60s, I imagine there also just weren't that many golf course architects. Or there am I, or am there I wrong? really weren't. And that's what I said when I basically became intrigued or interested in the profession. Uh, I asked Bill Robinson, I said, you know, how do I get a list of the architects? Well, there was a publication called Golfdom. And in the back, there was an advertisement for... Uh, golf architects sure. and you know there was about 20 and I wrote to every one of them you know seeing if they needed any help and I'll never forget Robert Trent Jones penned me a handwritten letter saying I like your resume and uh, there's a good chance if you're willing to travel I may have something for you and it turned out that he hired Reese's uh, college roommate, Cavill Robinson, okay. and he went over to Spain and, you know, basically ran the European operation for Trent Jones. But, you know, a, a lot of them did write back, which was nice, and that's, it was all letters back then. It wasn't mm -hmm. no internet or email. Sure. And, uh, you know, they're just, the call for an architect, if you could get one local, well, local and cheap. And I don't want to say at all was cheap, but he was very inexpensive. When I came to work for Ed, an average cost, you know, for his new design fee was six thousand um, dollars, which is ridiculous. Like, and in 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 so in nineteen seventy one. That was nineteen seventy one. What do you think a, a comparable cost or a comparable project Robert Trent Jones would have charged? 
probably in that era at least 250,000. And Pete Dye? Pete Dye didn't charge that much. Pete yeah. basically was uh, one of those people that um, he did a, a lot of work, but he did his own special projects. And, you know, he was very reasonable. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you know that the fees of like some of these people that got into it, the Nicholases and the Palmers or whatever, because of their professional affiliation. I mean, when Tiger Woods all of a sudden got a fee of like a million dollar, Jack said, I'll charge two. And then Jack basically said, well, then I want to, you know, a portion of the development, you know, so now it's five million. So <laughs> fees were negotiated in my era, they went skyrocketing. But yeah, when I'm like, oh, first, how, how could, how could he charge so little? Like what, how, like what was? Because he lived in a very modest house. He drove Chevy Impalas. <laughs> um, he basically, uh, his attorney, when we, he started flying or whatever, finally advised him, not his accountant, but his attorney, he said, you need to fly first class because you're not going to meet anybody that wants to do a golf course sitting in coach. Mm -hmm. So he did treat himself to first class, and Brian and I would be in the back somewhere, <laughs> the smoking section. But, you know, he did do that, but that was, he had a very modest living. Um, and, you know, it only cost, we developed new courses for about $320,000. Wow. And that's because Ed didn't believe in uh, automatic irrigation. He said, you need a damn electrician to work one of those things. So it was, it was manual where you needed a night waterman. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't put cart paths in. He said, the traffic will teach you where to go eventually, and then that's where they can put their cart paths. He didn't put sand in the bunkers because we would need that sod. We'd edge them the next year, strip the sod, and catch the rest of the thing. His golf courses back in that day took about three years to grow in until they were really prime condition. Um, Mother Nature grew a lot of them in. They were single row irrigation, if anything. Uh, so you didn't get water in the roughs. And it's just how this golf course, for instance, you see some places it has three or four rows of irrigation. Mm -hmm. So it was very, um, you know, why would you shop somewhere else you know, when you had Ed Alt right there in Washington. And you also had, you know, Al Jamison, who was a well-respected pro. The two of them, you know, tag team together and did a tremendous a lot, a lot of good work. So um, when you came on and there was this backlog of work, uh, do you remember, was, was the majority of that in the, in the greater uh, mid-Atlantic? It was, or was all, it all over. over. Now, by then, he had spread out all through Maryland and Virginia further out. In other mm -hmm. words, it wasn't just in... The beltway backyard was uh, there a big a kind of boom in golf courses being built around there oh yeah there was. i mean i i've been through personally i think at least three ups and downs in this um you know where the bottom fell out and you know we had very little work and then boom or slam with work again and was course, that due to like uh was that suburban sprawl it or? has to do sometimes with the economy mm -hmm. Uh, political parties, who knows? It right, just right. basically, uh, <laughs> Tiger Woods was a big boost. Sure. Uh, let's face it. I mean, when Tiger came along, uh, we were basically the busiest we've ever been because it opened golf up to everybody. Everybody wanted to be a player. Uh, so we built, you know, a golf course for, you know, with a country club for a day. And, you know, the National Golf Foundation publicized this announcement that we need to open one new course every day. And it was like, well, that's 365 a year. Well, we were putting out 400, 500 some years. Right. And I said, our firm at one time had 23 courses under construction, which includes nine and 18 whole courses. So that's pretty busy for, you know, we were, um, what I was gonna say, at the time we were probably a pretty large scale firm. We might've had 11 people or whatever um four five six you know associate architects the two partners when, when when you're managing that many projects at once um you know does that limit you from getting on site i mean the, the fact that you're regional and most of these pro or not most but a lot of the projects aren't too far away i would imagine make it well it was fortunate your advantage. at that time that basically they were almost clustered 
Hmm. I mean, Brian, for instance, uh, did a lot of the work. I mean, it's not, not that we had a division, but he would go kind of up north and I would go down south and west. And it just it worked out that way. I was introduced to a lot of Mr. Alt's work in Arkansas, and I'll, I wound up doing 24 courses in the state of Arkansas. Wow. So I spent three years of my life in Arkansas and never lived there a day. <laughs> but, you know, at one time I had four courses in various places in Arkansas, so I would fly out and then rent a car and drive around all these places. And how was that? I mean, how did that? Why Arkansas? How did that connection come about? <clears throat> It all started with um, a company called Cooper Communities, John Cooper. And I do not know the original association, but Mr. Cooper had done a course at their home, which is near Bentonville, Arkansas, um, called Bella Vista. And it was the Bella Vista Country Club. And the first architect there was Joe Finger. Mm -hmm. Well, for some reason, Joe Finger built a course with no bunkers. So how Mr. Alt got associated with Mr. Cooper, I do not know, but he wound up adding all the bunkers. And then Mr. Cooper gave him a job at a place called Cherokee Village. He gave him a job at Bella Vista again. He gave him a job at Hot Springs Village. These were all huge timber warehouser mm -hmm. projects that Cooper bought 15,000 acres down at Hot Springs Village. 13,000 acres up in Bella Vista. You think this is big as a thousand acres. Well, they were big. And in one village, in Hot Springs Village, I've done nine courses. Wow. Um, you know, and as I said, Mr. Alt did the first one and I remodeled it. So I got started in Arkansas and then the word spreads. It's just like he in the Beltway. Sure. I was doing courses all around Arkansas. Oh, wow. So, as I said, Cooper was the start of it, and then they started branching out into Tennessee and Missouri and mm -hmm. um, South Carolina. So mm -hmm. I went with them. I did 20-some courses for Cooper. When you joined the firm, when we joined uh, Mr. Alt, um, was, uh, I, we, we've, we've had a few conversations over the phone before today, and we've been chatting through the course, but at, at some point you told me, <coughs> Your offices were, were right in Kensington, Maryland. Is that where they were when you joined? No, uh, they were in Silver Spring. Um, actually, Silver Spring's a, you know, a big word, <laughs> meaning it, it covers a lot of territory. Sure. We were very close to Bethesda, downtown Bethesda, and literally on Old Georgetown Pike. Um, and we had a nice, we were in a high rise or whatever, and uh, I'll, never forget that Mr. Alt and his wife, who worked for us, who did the secretarial work, had the only two parking spaces, and I was <laughs> forced to find residential parking and run to work every morning to make it on time. But that's where we started, and then we moved to um, Wheaton, Maryland, which is where he lived, where mm -hmm. his house was, because he was uh, probably five minutes away. And then we finally eventually, Brian and I, when we became Alton Clark, bought uh, a building in Kensington. Got it. And as I said, it was the, the uh, thing was originally Evan B. Alt Limited. Then it was actually uh, Alton Beeman. Alton oh, Dean Beeman. <laughs> yep. And, you know, Dean became a member of the firm when he was still a golf professional. And he brought two or three really good projects with them. Uh, one of them was this place called, a horse farm called Avenel. And then there was one on the Chesapeake Bay, which was one of the greatest sights I've ever seen. As you drive over the bridge, you can actually still see it. But that was another site. And then his father-in-law wanted to build a course. So we were basically gonna build one there. Well, when he became tour commissioner, he had to do away with all his outside interest, and mm -hmm. that was the golf course architecture angle. And uh, Dean Beeman became the commissioner of the PGA Tour in the early 70s? Yeah, and it's basically, they were located right there in River, off River Road. Right. right. And that's where basically, you know, Eddie and he had become very good friends, and mm -hmm. I had become friendly with him, and his secretary, Judy, who by then he was, I believe, divorced, and married eventually Judy, his secretary. And, you know, it was one big happy family. 
And Eddie Little. And, and so Dean Beeman is still playing, is playing on the tour during this time. No, no, he's tour commissioner when he's, once he became tour commissioner, he lived in the Washington area, as you okay. know. But when he's working with, with, with Ed. No, he was not. He was already off the tour. Yeah. Okay. No, no, he was on the tour. But when he became tour commissioner, he could yeah. not work with Ed. Got it. Okay. So all his outside interests, he had a real estate firm or whatever. He had to dissolve all those because he was tour commissioner. Sure. So that's where Mr. Alt brought him Stadium Golf. Right. And this all basically stems from Ed Alt's. Uh, he was, in his younger days, he was in the minor leagues. He was a pretty good catcher. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he basically said, well, why don't we build golf courses like, you know, these baseball stadiums so people can view it. And there was a big article in the Washington Post. I think it was Dick Slay. I still have it somewhere. Wrote it. Ed Alt, you know, thinks that golf courses should be built for like stadiums. Well, when we basically, then Dean could ask us to work on some of his projects. Mm -hmm. And Ed said, instead of paying for uh, rental on all these, uh, you know, uh, private clubs, why don't you build your own? And, you know, hence the, the idea of building them as stadiums. Well, we started with a project down in Jacksonville, Florida, Sawgrass, the original Sawgrass. Mm -hmm. And we rebuilt that course for the uh, tour Is players. Is this Sawgrass Country Club that's Sawgrass across the Country street Club. from yep. the TPC? Yeah. And literally, um, Gardner Dickinson was my design consultant there. I was like the project architect because Mr. Alt didn't want to fly back and forth all the time, so I would fly down and meet Gardner and mm -hmm. you know we did all these sketches and we came up with these waste bunkers with shells and we closed up the front of all these greens and then they had the first tournament and I think Mark Hayes won it because he was from Oklahoma and they know how to keep the ball under the wind and I think the average score the first day was 76 or 77. So it was tough and it had to get you know loosened up a little bit after that first year but then we got involved in, you know, um, Mr. Fletcher, whatever, across A1A or whatever on this property and said, you know, I'll give you this if you'll build one of your new stadium golf courses. So we did the original, like, layout for that golf course with, you know, because of the, with the television areas mm -hmm. and, you know, how to drain it, how to do this. And then Dean, you know, basically chose Pete Dye to do the actual fundamental work, did the architecture, which kind of broke Mr. Alt's heart because he figured, you know, we would do the first stadium golf course together. Well, obviously, in the back burner, Dean Beeman still had Avenel, mm -hmm. and, you know, subsequently, uh, that was a, a funny story. At the time, I mean, I, I can absolutely imagine that that would, that would break Mr. Alt's heart. Uh, but I mean, Pete Dye at the time was, um, you know, what was his rep? I mean, he's a, a Pete very Dye, highly regarded. Pete Dye player. at the time was, what can I say? Well, it was cutting edge, but he was on the very beginning of his career. Okay. He had done Harbor Town, mm -hmm. and that was his claim to fame. Of course, he did that with Jack Nicholas. Now Jack is claiming that as one of his courses. I see that now publicized in the Nicholas Diaries. But, you know, that was Pete. Uh, at his best, and literally, you know, as Pete admits, he said, well, what can you, what, how can you be better than Arnold Palmer wins your first tournament? Sure. <laughs> so that was his springboard. And, and Dean Beeman actually said, there's, there's a book out, I don't know if you, but it's uh, a book about Dean, a biography of Dean Beeman yeah. called Golf's Driving Course. I'm actually, I'm in the middle of reading it right now, but it's by Adam Shupak, but there's a, there's a section in there where, where he talks about um, his relationship with, with, with Ed Alt. Yeah, and, and he does give him credit for the stadium yep, golf in there, which, you know, everyone says Dean Beeman's the father of stadium golf. Well, Eddie Alt was the real one that brought it to him, and Dean admits that. And consequently, uh, we've taken it so much further. I mean, the original uh, design at Avenel, I mean, we had bleachers, you know, in the back out of dirt and stuff, and, you know, things that really wouldn't have worked, you know, with the, the rains and things like that. And they did that down at the TPC. Mm -hmm. They built, you know, uh, bleachers and all those mounds and everything. 
So that was a fascinating period because with how long how long was Avenel then after Sawgrass? Oh, quite a, quite a few years. Yeah. But Alan McCurick was the PGA Tour's agronomist, and Alan McCurick was also a good friend of Mr. Alt. He was the superintendent at one time of both Chevy Chase and Columbia at the same time. Oh, wow. And literally, Alan started giving us work. Well, Mr. Alt didn't want to travel at the time, so, okay, we've got um, Arizona Country Club. Johnny Miller keeps shooting 63. What can we do to change this? So I was sent out, and we compl completely remodeled Arizona Country Club. Then it was El Dorado out in California. Johnny Miller shooting lights out out here, too. Mm -hmm. What can we do to change that? And then it was Pleasant Valley up in uh, New England. And then I was sent up to Hamilton Golf and Country Club in Canada, where I became like their consultant for 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, they had four Canadian Opens during that time. So it was a wonderful <laughs> opportunity that we got, you know, spread around because of Dean, because of Alan McCurick, um, and just got a, a terrific, you know, introduction to golf all over the country. So one thing, of course, leads to another. You know, we get hired in Arizona, and then I'm doing another job over in Tucson. Do you think, you know, uh, going back to, you know, Mr. Alt's almost heart being broken a bit over sawgrass, that over the, over the next years and decades, Dean almost made, he was trying to make up for that in a way by, get, by making sure that I'm sure he was he making was. a lot of introductions and I'm getting sure a lot of I'm sure he was. I mean, it was like, you know, as I said, they had formed a pretty good bond and friendship. Mm -hmm. You know, and Eddie was always, you know, innovative. I mean, it was funny. His architecture wasn't necessarily innovative, um, but his thoughts. I mean, he, when we got in the car at oh, dark 30 every time, you know, we went on a trip, he's talking. And he's thinking about this and talking about that. What do you think of this, guys? And, uh, and you've mentioned this to, to, to that point on, on one of our previous kind of phone conversations that he, uh, he wasn't necessarily a, a student of classic architecture necessarily. No, he wasn't. Uh, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's just, for instance, when, you know, we go over to Columbia Country Club or something, mm -hmm. he was called in to redesign a lot of that. It, there's four greens over there that he did. They look nothing like the original greens. Uh, not to say that the next guy that came in was Algie Pulley, and he did a couple of greens, and they don't look anything like it. In other words, it's kind of like when, you know, Congressional is a good example. Devereaux Emmett was the original architect, and then Reese Jones came in, and, or Robert Trent Jones, excuse me, came in and completely redid it. Um, and they had an opener, too. And then Reese Jones redid it. And then I think Reese redid it again. <laughs> And then now uh, Andrew Green has redone it again, can, mm -hmm. you know, and this is what happens. They've now gone back to Devereaux Emmett. He said, yeah. we're bringing back Devereaux Emmett. Right. That's, that's what's in vogue. So now. this is in vogue. Yeah. And as I said, uh, this is, you know, I guess my learning curve uh, all through my career is, you know, some of these old guys really had it, meaning they had some brilliant mm -hmm. ideas and all. A lot of it had to do, they had limitations in the fact they didn't have these, you know, mechanical dozers and stuff to make these gentle curves and tie in everything beautifully. Some of their architecture was sharper, but it made it more difficult. Right. It was like your little pitch shot behind 17 today where it falls off quickly. I mean, they're always harder to judge. Uh, and that's what makes classic architecture so uh, intriguing. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like what I'm tried to do here at Cut Along was bring back some classic features sure. and, you know, reintroduce that. <laughs> Situation being that we went from course to course and we would even go to a nine hole course and maybe um, Donald Ross did the first nine. Well, you know, we wouldn't care. We'd just say, oh, here's our new nine. And that, what I mean by we is I said Mr. Alt at the time, I'm following suit is to basically what he wants to do. We're going to do a modern golf course. Mm -hmm. But it's, it turns out Donald Ross was a pretty sharp architect in his own right. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just visited a, uh, a couple weeks ago one of the first courses I ever worked on, which was Norfolk Country Club, or excuse me, Hampton Country Club, 
in Hampton, Virginia, and it was a Donald Ross course. Well, the city had acquired some additional property and they wanted to redo it. So we were called, called in to redo it and you know, we did a nice little layout with you know some of the extra property they got. Well, I got a call a year later that what, you just ruined a perfectly good Donald Ross course. Well, like, well, you know, if Donald saw it, I'm sure he wouldn't have been that, you know, upset with what, you know, I've done. Mm -hmm. So what would they would, would Ed or yourself get pushback ever from from the, whoever is commissioning the project or would they really leave it up to you to, you know, this is in your hands? No, they basically would leave it up to us. Yeah. And, you know, one of your questions you asked before was the difference between working for private clubs and municipalities. Mm -hmm. And, and a, a quick answer is to say, usually in a municipality, you work for one or two people. There's like the people that are assigned to the golf course project. In a private club, you're working for 400. And they all have architectural opinions. So it's a lot harder. Um, that, you know, this is, in you know, my career, Brian loved remodeling. Uh, I love building new courses because I only usually have one owner and that's really what you're trying to satisfy. Does he want this as a money maker? Does he want this as, you know, um, you know something else? It's, is this just for a home site enhancement? Mm -hmm. So you're satisfying one owner. Where it's really difficult in a private club when you redo it, everybody's happy. Well, why do we need to do this or you know whatever so that's you know kind of the way things have been uh for generations it's like um it's just you know i find it so much more relaxing working for one owner sure in other words brian found it more relaxing going up to upstate new jersey and all the traffic and <laughs> i said oh well if you enjoy that so be it so at what point in your career, so you, you get started with, with Mr. Alt's firm in 1971, you work for him for, for quite a number of years. He, is he still working? He passes away in, was it 1989? Oh, yeah. Is he still working right up until he passes? <coughs> he is, and by then we become all Clark and Associates. Brian came, I started in 71, I think Brian came in 73. Okay. Uh, we hit it off right away, because as I said, uh, the old SOB, son of a boss, he, he took all the pressure off me and <laughs> Mr. Alt then picked on him. And as I said, we basically um, had a heck of a lot of work to do. And he would be going one way, I'd be going another way. Uh, as I said, Mr. Alt had kind of cut down on his flying and that kind of travel, but you know, when we all get together, you know, on a driving trip, you know, we, the three of us would get together. And then pretty soon Brian started doing his work and I started doing my work and Eddie was, you know, he would work in the mornings, he'd come in the office to make sure we were there at 8.30 and then he would always call at five minutes to five to make sure we were still there. <laughs> and then he would go out to Indian Springs and play cards or whatever. Um, you know, he was in the semi-retirement, but sure. he was still working. Um, I mean, if the calls were coming in uh, back in that era or whatever, they were for Ed. But then what happened, you know, Brian and I were, you know, uh, feeling that we're an integral part of this and are we ever going to become partners? Well, he had no real appetite for that. So, I mean... We really had to say Ed, Ed had no appetite. No, we basically said we're going to start our own firm. <laughs> and this is this is when this is in the eighties, in the early eighties or yeah. whatever. And the next thing, the lawyers are there the next day, and it becomes all Clark and Associates. Well, it's kind of funny because all Clark and Associates kind of sounds like Ed and Tom Clark. Right. Uh, Brian's also an equal partner, but nobody knows that. Got it. So, for instance, when we did Avenel, even though I was the project architect, I got a, you know, a lifetime membership, and, of course, so did Ed, but Brian didn't get anything because they didn't even know he was a member of the firm. <laughs> it's like, so, you know, it's just, we should have named it All Alton Clark or something, but, you know, what's past this prologue. So but, is that around when, like, what did, did he, 
when did you start essentially cre uh, designing your own courses? Did you have to wait until you became a partner, or did you get jobs where you were designing? Oh, no, no, no. I was doing that work, for instance, out in Arkansas. That was well before you. Yeah, but even though it was, quote, Edmund B. Alt Limited, it's like I was the project architect. You would never right. see it, and, you know. And so, you're, so it, I was, and so your name is on it. Yeah. In other words, my list of courses, I list basically with, you know, when I was working with Edmund B. Alt Limited, and, you know, basically when I if it was, if Brian was part of the project, if Bill Love was part of the project, if Dan Schlegel was part of the project, that's how I list all my sure. courses. But, you know, as I said, for the last 20 some years, they, there hasn't been anybody else involved in them. Yeah. Um, so your, your course list now that, that, that Tom, not Ed all, not Brian all, that Tom Clark is the lead architect or designer is, yeah. in, is in the triple digits. In, in, do I have that right? Well, it is meaning it, going back to the beginning because some of those were when I was project architect for Edmund B. Alt. Mm -hmm. And for instance, I list, um, I'm trying to think, um, Herndon. For instance, Mr. Alt would go to Florida every winter. Well, Herndon Golf Course started, and he's out in Florida. So by the time he's back, it's literally rough graded, done, finished. Right. So, you know, that's like, that's really was my golf course. And then I actually got to redesign it <laughs> years yeah. later. Um, and he never understood why I put that lake on top of the hill, but it made sense at the time. He said, what did you put that lake up here for? Anyway. L uh, lake on the top, I'm trying to picture, I, I've played Herndon a thousand times. Where, where's the lake on the top of the well, hill? Well, there's, when you cross over the railroad or whatever, there's immediately four holes. Um, yeah. Oh, and, and so there's a little par three that it's has a par a three on the back it. nine, like number, you know, thirteen or fourteen or something like that. Yeah, I'm not I, sure. I can't the remember the number, number but yes, I, I, I guess that I never, I never thought of it as being on the top of a hill. But you're right, it is on the top of a hill. Well, but we <laughs> needed the dirt, so we <laughs> dug a lake. Right. Um, Tom Clark's name is on over a hundred golf courses, uh, a lot of which are, are in the Washington D.C. area. Uh, since this is this is Beltway Golfer, and you know we're focusing on, on the, the, the greater Washington, D.C. region in the mid-Atlantic. Um, you, you've got your name on a, on a handful around the area yourself. So, so Herndon, uh, you had mentioned earlier Pleasant Valley. Pleasant Valley, River Creek, Blue Ridge Shadows. Um, I have to get, refer to my list No, here. please. Do any, are, are there any, I'm kind of curious just for our listeners. Penderbrook. Penderbrook, sure. Avenel, Cross Creek, Cross Creek, R.I.P. Oak Creek. Oh, Cross Creek is no longer there. Cross Creek closed. I want to say maybe two years ago. Maybe a year. Maybe maybe it was last year. Well, that's um, amazing. That's a home site development. I was going to ask you about that because there there was that that had. Do you remember working a lot on that course? Because oh it, yeah. So that, that had to have been a challenging because it, it seems like there's. It wasn't a ton of There was of a room. lot of environmental problems there. Um, Landscapes Unlimited uh, basically was the contractor. Um, Landscapes, Bill Kubley is a personal friend, and he talked Brian and I as partners into partnering with him on Cross Creek. In other words, we would donate our design fee, um, and we would have a portion then of the golf course. Mm -hmm. Well, he assigned a man to Cross Creek who really shouldn't have been assigned. He started construction without all the permits. I'm like, you know, John, you can't do this. They're going to shut you down. They sure. did. <coughs> so immediately they had the county, you know, uh, looking over their shoulder. And instead of the budget being, we'll call it $3 million, it became $6 million. So they went way over budget. Um, in other words, some of the... Um, environmental areas we cleared out which we were allowed to do but because they were upset they made us put all the junk back in there mm -hmm. so if you hit a ball in there you couldn't find it so it had a lot of problems it was a tight site to say the least um, and then you know it uh, was sold and then there was you know a number of people that I did some work for there became lawsuits with the 
inner county connector, mm -hmm. which was never going to be built. You know, in other words, you can go right in that, Tom. You don't yeah. worry about that inner county connector. <laughs> it's like then they build it. Yeah. And we're like, well, this hole now is, you know, got to be moved over. So we had to convert one of the holes, and this was after the fact, to a par three instead of a par four or whatever. Yeah, there was a, a lot of inherent problems with that property, which happens at a lot of golf courses. Uh, you don't always hear the back drop or the background that that's what i was going to get at because a, a lot of the courses even the handful that you just mentioned there in the dc area um aside from blue ridge shadows most of them are, are residential developments well there was another one south view which is then became potomac potomac ridge yeah potomac ridge i did oakmar i did army navy potomac ridge was that was 27 holes right or, or well, we I did the first 18, okay, and then I believe which uh, also that all that course also closed in the last yeah, couple of years, huh? yeah, and that I believe became a home site development. But I guess what I what I'm getting at is, you know, the 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 challenges like so take a Blue Ridge Shadows, so Blue Ridge and and, and I don't know anything I don't know anything about it other than the fact that I've played it a handful of times, but it but it's a beautiful course, but it but from from my perspective, not knowing anything that went into building it and any of the backstory. It seems like you would have a lot more to work with because it seems to be open land. There's not a bunch of houses out there. <laughs> Maybe I'm totally wrong. Well, Blue Ridge Shadows has a very interesting history. There was two owners, Rick McGallis and John Hopkins. And Mr. Hopkins knew nothing about golf. All he knew was finance and money. And he said, we've got to build this course for less than $2.5 million, and we're only going to give the architect 150000 which isn't too bad, meaning... So I went to Brian and I said, I think I can hand draw these plans and make this come in, you know, in our favor and not lose any money on it. Well, I did that. All the plans are hand drawn. As a matter of fact, I sent them to Michigan State or whatever. They have archives for architects mm -hmm. and they um, microfiched them or whatever sure. and sent them back to me. This is the last hand drawn set of plans. I mean, we had CAD drawings, which we could have converted into CAD, but that would have taken more time, more money. Consequently, Blue Ridge Shadows was the first course I've ever worked on where the owners basically gave away the development, sold that, and kept the golf course. Usually they're trying to get rid of the golf course right, and the keep right. the development. But they sold the whole surrounding property to D.R. Horton. Uh, and what they were interested in was building a hotel. So that, I think it's a Holiday Inn Express or whatever. Yep. They originally, I think it was supposed to be like 14 million or something, and they wound up spending 30 million. It became a disaster, and un it's unfortunate because when it opened was 2008, meaning it was right in the heart of you know, and mm -hmm. everything kind of spiraled down since then. Uh, it's now so is, is that is that to mean that, so it, it, its plan was to be a residential development. But yeah. it was the first residential development. In other words, they had already sanctioned out this space and here's the golf course. Right. Normally, I as an architect would be first in line mm -hmm. and I would integrate the golf course within the development. Sure. We and maybe work with the developers saying this, you know, this really works. Right. This well, fairway you get works better exposure, here. you know, from these home sites, sure. uh, you know, when you're looking down on the golf course. In other words, we're close to these wetland areas, just like this golf course. Mm -hmm. All those houses are up here on the hill. All those, you know, whatever units or whatever they intend. We're down at the bottom. So everybody gets to see the golf course. Blue Ridge Shadows is right in the center. So it's a core golf course, which is a very nice thing. And, you know, in other words, you're not hitting down in between houses. There are some, a couple holes that have, you know, houses on the perimeter, but it's just one side of the hole. So Blue Ridge Shadows was another one I said I would happen to be, you know, when I lived in McLean, uh, it started, but when I finished, I'd moved out to Fauquier County, and it was only 30 minutes from my new house. So I got to go there a uh, hundred times or whatever during its development. As to River Creek, I lived in McLean, I would get to River Creek quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So the courses you could get to a lot, I think, became some of my best courses. Pleasant Valley was another one. Because um, when you're getting to them a lot, you can make you adjustments. You have a lot more input. Uh, and as it's being built, are you ma are you changing things? You're see are you seeing things, things? constantly change? This course here has morphed so many times. Mm -hmm. You know, just 
that green right you're looking here in the background was is completely not what it started out to be. Uh, the bunkering, you know, we decided to do an Augusta flash up bunkering in the principal's nose. Mm -hmm. I mean, these were things that were just made in the field and decisions. Uh, this green was slid down off this hill to make it a little more less challenging because it's still such a difficult hole. But you really can't do when you're when you're designing you can, a course from an office or from a, from right. hundreds you of miles away. You have to do plans and specs because you have to get them permitted. Sure. I mean, this is the big difference. When I started, there were no permits. There were no, um, you know. Um, waiting time there was no fish and game commission looking over this there were no wetlands mm -hmm. there were no waters of the u.s there were no endangered species there were no um you know tree conservation i mean everything has changed and you know rightfully so but we never would go into like swamps and stuff people think oh my god they were just dredging out the swamp mm -hmm. well what would we want to go in there for if it takes all that time and money to fix you know we're the old architects, they got the best sites. I mean, they basically, um, you know, were all in upland areas. They didn't build down in, you know, lowland areas, but that's what happens with development. You're down in the low areas where all the drainages are, so you suffer floods, you suffer a lot of different damages that, you know, old courses really didn't have to involve themselves with. I mean, you can just look at these holes right here drainage here, drainage there, mm -hmm. you know, and that's one side of the hole. The upside of the hole is development. So we're always down in the lowland areas. Uh, so sticking like, so in that process, like take Blue Ridge Shadows, like you mentioned, the, the, the areas and the corridors for the golf course, those were already decided this, by the time it got In this particular to. case, um, some engineers basically had said, okay, this is development, this is golf. Now, does that leave you a lot of flexibility when that's? Very little. The problem was that we were in a competition. They had actually interviewed, I believe, 12 architects, which shocked me because I kind of came in at the end and won the day, and it was very fortunate. And I said, I can do this for under two and a half million, and I can basically accept your gracious offer of, you know for the fee and I was hired you know on the spot but the thing was they had you know other architects said well you need 50 more acres uh, you know and then I looked at some of the plans on some of them and you know obviously they hadn't worked on topography before I mean some of them they had holes on like a three to one slope or whatever but like just as an example like take number and I'm, I haven't played blue BRS in a while but number like a number 11 where you're, where you're really elevated T going mm -hmm. down into the valley and yep. then it curves left. Like, is, is, is how much of that is already decided for you and how much of that, that is? None of that was. Okay. No, no, this was all just basically the fact that the core was there and what could you do. Got it. Now, there are some What holes. directions you're going, that's all you. Right? Yeah, no. I mean, and it was basically, I had, you know, they had said, well, we had a plan submitted and it was uh, no more than 6,000 yards. Well, Blue Ridge Shadows is 7,100 or something. Uh, from the tips. I mean, you know, I got a big golf course on a very tight, mm -hmm. you know, piece of property because I know how to work, you know, and sure. that was the one thing Mr. Alt did praise me. He said, you're the best rooter of a golf course that has ever come along. And he had several people work for him, and, you know, over the years. And I feel that that's the key, like, to this golf course. I mean, for instance, when Ron Witten saw it, he said, this thing just lays right on the land. You know, we don't mm -hmm. have to do any earth movement. And that was the whole objective out here. And that's where some architects fail. I mean, there are some notable architects that, you know, they can't build a golf course for less than $12 million because they don't necessarily know how to root it correctly. Right. Uh, but that's got to be a, a skill in itself. I mean, it's, it sounds, you know, having designed over 100 courses, you, you've been hired, I imagine, by all sorts of different people, municipalities, you know, uh, private courses, different but a lot of them sound like developers, and I would imagine a lot of them were developers, and that's are what developers I said. the hardest to work with? No, not necessarily, and that's what I said. The, the Cooper communities I've done twenty four courses for. And it's hard to keep, you know, you don't make somebody happy uh, just because of your fees, or you know, you've given them quality golf courses in South Carolina, in Tennessee, in mm -hmm. Missouri, 
in Arkansas. All, every place they've gone, you know, we've done really good work. And consequently, then they hire for the next course. I mean, each one of their developments is two or three courses. In other words, you know, down in Tennessee, there's three courses, Toqua, Tanasi, and Tahiti. And down in South Carolina, there were two, Monticello and, I don't know, forget the first one, Tara. <laughs> anyway, the point is that that's, they were easy to work with because they knew what they were going to get. I finally convinced Cooper to hire quality contractors uh, because when I started with them, they were trying to build them themselves and make them even cheaper. Well, that, they had gotten a lot of that from Ed Alt. <laughs> I mean, he loved his, what he called Jake leg contractors, small time mm -hmm. uh, people that, you know, were not necessarily quality, but they could do it very inexpensively, which is another reason he kept getting hired for more and more courses. Now, some of these people, as I said, as soon as I started working with these big firms like Wadsworth and Landscapes, it was a whole new world because so much of the onus now went on them. I mean, I didn't have to be there to make sure that, you know, this pipe was actually buried and bedded correctly. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they are quality <laughs> people and they're going to do quality work. And they will actually help you and say, hey, Tom, if we put a little drainage here, don't you think that would help? We'll add a basin. Yeah. And, you know, we'll do it on our dime. We'll just move this basin from over here and put it here. So quality <coughs> contractors help you tremendously. Sure. And those developers or whatever, you know, would also hire the same contractors to do the next job. What about, so like if you, you compare a few of the, the, the local ones that you mentioned, like Herndon, River Creek, Pleasant Valley, Blue Ridge Shadows, Herndon compared to really any of those three, but certainly River Creek or Blue Ridge Shadows, um, not quite as many features, maybe not as desirable of a property. It was a small property. It was basically, you know, a hike and bike trail through the middle of an old railroad line, uh, a short course. Uh, a fun course, um, a municipal course. Mm -hmm. I used Herndon as an example. Was that earlier in your career that you very, did? Very, it was yeah. one of the first things I did. Is that right? Yeah, well, yeah, because it, Mr. Alt was in Florida. <coughs> and consequently, that's why I said I got to be the project architect. But the point was, it was just like, that golf course paid for everything in the town. All the softball fields, the lights, the tennis courts, the lights. You know, the golf course paid for all this stuff. And I use that as an example about municipal golf. That back in the day, I mean, Herndon would do 50,000 rounds or 60,000 rounds. And of as golf. I said, it's a short course. I remember that was where I, I told you I had a career around one time and basically uh, shot, you know, one under par, and that was for Herndon. And that was the day after New Year's, which. We decided to get together at a New Year's party and went out the next day, and I had the career round. That's, that's, so anyway. that's the way it always seems to happen. What, what about, so you, I mean, you, you, you've had a, a, a long career. I mean, 1971 and, you know. This next, June will be my 50th year. 50 years. Yeah. How, so how would you say your, your style, your, you know, what, what, what you do has evolved over, over the years. I mean, do you, do you it's take It's continuing a to evolve. And that's what I said. This probably is the zenith of my career, meaning I put all 50 years into this golf course, all different. I mean, as I said, the bunker styles are different. Each hole's different. Philosophy's different. Strategy's different. And then, you know, I'm anxious to move on to another one. Sure. But this may be it. In other words, there are so few courses being developed now, and you know they're going to a very small pool of architects. And I certainly think that Gil Hans and Tom Doak and Cor Crenshaw have raised the bar, meaning they're the hot commodity right now, and deservingly so. But you know we have one major developer, Mike Kaiser, out there building these courses, and that's who, his staple of architects. Mm -hmm. There's not a whole lot of other you know, places to choose from. Now, I have a project in Oklahoma right now, but it's an 18-hole par three. Um, you know, it's not an 18-hole regulation course. So at the time of 2008, I had, 
I think four or five projects that were already plans and specs and ready to go out for bids. And this is the only one that got finished. All those others have either dropped the golf course because they couldn't get financing for it. Uh, the developments have never started. Um, well, you know, the, your, your um, extensive career and, and, and 50 years as a golf course architect and, and golf, golf course designer, um, you know, this, this is quite a pinnacle that, that we played today and I got to check out uh, Cut Along at Lake Anna. So I think this is probably a good point in the conversation to, to switch to to this course. To, to well, your, I appreciate to, that. To your, and, to your uh, current project. First of all, I have a question for you. Did sure. you have fun today? I had, a, I had a lot of fun. I don't have a good golf game, but I don't really care. I'm a, I'm a regular dude living in D.C., and I want to know about D.C.-centric golf stuff. And if you can tell me something that I don't already know, then that is great for me. I don't want the regular stuff. I want exciting stuff. I want different stuff. I don't want stuff I can't hear elsewhere. But I want it to be about D.C. golf.